we will be talking about tilings and uh, looking at it uh, from various directions uh, there will so there are a lot of slides here as you might notice there is uh, 126 slides which i would like to get to but it's not necessary i would like to get to a place where everyone understands so if you have a question if you have a doubt please stop me please interrupt me please ask me questions i would rather cover 10 slides where everyone is on the same page than cover 126 where uh, nobody got anything okay all right so uh suppose we are given infinite copies of some square tiles with colors on the boundary so just to keep something in mind you have these two tiles uh, you have blue on the boundary black yellow and green and then you have the same colors uh, reflected uh, rotated so now the question i'm going to ask you is the following there's some rules in which you can put them together so what are these rules they're just like the puzzle rules that you had as a kid you know that, that if things fit together then you put them together so now what is the fitting rule here the fitting rule is that the colors should match so and the question now is so it, using this rules as you can see in this tiling that you have this matching at all the edges and using this i tiled the entire plane in a beautiful periodic fashion right if you see this shape is repeated all through and this is a way to tile the plane starting with these tiles with these rules in fact it's the only way but as i said uh, if these colors are not the same then you cannot uh, put it there so this is an incorrect tiling because these colors don't match so this is the question can you tile the plane we are given infinite copies of square tiles with colors on their boundary we can put them together if the colors match if the colors don't match then we cannot place them next to each other as simple as it as that is and how do we answer this question okay so let's look at this very simple example which we uh, uh, which we had before so we can tile this periodically and i'm repeating myself just to make sure that we are all on the same page. However, what about these tiles? So I want the audience to look at these tiles. And OK, so Pi Maths World has raised uh, his hand. Uh, do you see why? Uh, do you see something about these tiles? So the question is, you have these tiles. The rules are you can put them together if and only if the colors match. OK? So the question is, can you use these tiles to tile the plane? So can so either one person unmutes themselves and answers the question, or they uh, or they raise their hand and I'll choose them. So. So the question is very simple. You are given these four tiles. And the question is, can you tile the plane with these tiles uh, using the rules which I told you? Is it possible to mirror the tile in the sense of flip it upside down? or No, 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 no. So they should be as they are given. No flipping, no rotation, nothing. Then I 
believe it's not possible as my guess that's absolutely correct indeed uh and uh, could you tell us a little more why do you think that that's not possible Uh, because uh, if we place the same color next to each other, uh, the mm-hmm. we have to as in since the lengths are not matching. For example, I'm looking at the lower two tiles. Since uh-huh. the lengths are not matching, to so assume that the lengths are matching, these are not perfect. That's not the problem. But uh, yeah, still, I think you have the right idea. Okay. Uh, even okay, if the lengths are matching again. Uh. No, the pink ones are, uh-huh. are as in we don't have one type. So your voice broke off, uh, Jesse. Uh, uh, I am pronouncing your name correctly, Jesse or Jesse, or what should it be? Uh, this is sad. We just lost him. Okay, so I think he was somewhat in the right uh, direction, and the idea is very simple. So you have this red color which matches here. So this means that I can put these two tiles together. But now, once I put these two tiles uh, together, what will I put above it? There's only one tile I can put above it, which is this one, right? And there's only one tile which I can place above this one. It is this one. But once I put these three together, there's a problem here. So the problem is I cannot even tile a two by two box. Forget about uh, entire the entire plane. So these tiles, uh, and just it was in the right direction, I think, cannot tile the plane. That's the answer. So we. Encountered two different systems: one where a tiling was possible, and one where the tiling was not possible. So, what is our method? How how how, do, how should we start thinking about this problem? The way one would think about this problem, you know, one does not have infinite time or resource. So, what one does is the following: we start trying to put these tiles together in whatever way we can. So we try by forming all combinations. If at some point we see that we cannot tile anymore, like we saw in this case, then we know that no such tiling exists. But if these attempts, we see that the top and the bottom edge match, then we can continue periodically. So what happens here? You see that this is the same as this color. This is the same as this color. These colors are the same. So that means I can use this as a block, and I can repeat it again and again, right? So now I've given you two different simple ideas. One in which. Uh, you know there's this strategy that we have in place that if uh, that we start trying to put them together if at some point we cannot tile any more then we know that no such tiling exists but if in these attempts we see that the top and bottom edge and the left and right edge for some rectangle matches up then we can periodically continue and get a tiling so this is a fine strategy my question to you is what is the problem with this strategy what would go wrong so the question again i repeat is the following you are given a bunch of tiles you have colors on the edges of tiles and you want to know whether these can tile the entire plane and you have the strategy in place where you try to put them together and maybe you reach a point at which beyond which you cannot tile the plane and you give up and you say that i'm done or you find a periodic one what is the problem with the strategy uh 
So the problem with this strategy is the following. You might continue indefinitely, right? I can keep on putting tiles one after another, one after another, and at no point of time I will need I'll reach neither state. Neither will I have periodicity, nor will I have uh, non-tileability. So this uh, led Professor Hao Wang to ask the following question: If there is a way to tile the plane. Is there necessarily a way to tile the paint plane periodically? So this is in the specific model where you have colored tiles and you have these rules to put them together. And uh, Wong's motivation was not just solving puzzles. Uh, his motivation came from something very, very different. Suppose you want to build a machine which can prove theorems on its own, can write down proofs of theorems. So there was a class of problems that uh, Wong was written uh, was working on and while working on this problem this question automatically arose so the question is is there a way to tile the plane if if there is a way to tile the plane with these kind of tiles is there a way to tile it periodically so i would uh, appreciate some guesswork here what do people think what, the, what is the answer? Do you think that if there's a way to tile the plane, there'll necessarily be a periodic way to tile it? Uh, so someone unmuted, but I did not hear the answer. I think it was, uh, the name started with N, this is all I, uh, well, it was an N-I-M, but uh, that's all I noticed. So I, I think the question is clear. And uh, so Dilshad raised his hand or her hand, I'm not sure. Yes, you can uh, ask a question or answer uh, what I've asked for. Um, yes, I'm audible. Yes, yeah. Yes, I think that we can tile it periodically. We can tile it periodically. Okay. Is there anyone else with a different opinion? Okay. So then I'll take everyone's opinion that we can tile it periodically. If you object with this, then you should uh, stand up for your opinion. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, we are talking about 2D tiling. Yes. Uh, I think it's not possible to, as in it need not be periodically tiled. OK. OK. Uh, I can't think of an example, though. That's OK. That's OK. OK. So there are some people who think that there is no tiling. There are some people who think that there is a tiling. And instead of raising hands, just unmute yourself and talk. That's perfectly fine, OK? All right. So it turns out, as I said, if the answer is yes, then we can give a method to decide an algorithm where if I'm given a set of tiles, it can tile the plane. So she has opinion. She has opinion was uh, uh, would be very very helpful because it would give us a method. It would give us an algorithm to find out these things. If the answer is no, then God knows what will happen. And as we have indicated, it turns out. It took six years after Hao Wang raised this question that there is no algorithm which can decide whether a tile can tile the plane, which in particular means it must happen that there is a set of tiles which can only tile a periodically. Constructing such a set of tiles is difficult. Uh, it took me a very long time, at least uh, 
at least a few days to understand why a given set of tiles can't tile the plane. In other words, the tiling problem is undecidable. You can't write down an algorithm for it. Now, the question which you should ask at this point is, how does one go about proving something like this? How, see, you, what kind of mathematical facts are we used to? We are used to facts like, OK, square root 2 is irrational. Or uh, we are used to the fact, uh, say, um, the you can't have a general solution to the fifth uh, degree polynomial. But what is this? This is saying that you can't you can't write down an algorithm for something like how how, how does one go about this? So the germ of this idea goes into what I heard very recently in a talk by Avi Vidnesson. So what he called it is a refutation of Hilbert's dream. So what was Hilbert's dream? So there were many, many questions raised by Hilbert, but sort of the essence of a few questions was the following. It asked, sort of tried to ask, what is the nature of truth? What is the nature of provable truth? And are these two, uh, are these two notions, the truth and the provable truth, are they the same? And the second kind of question was, suppose that something is provable, something that you can write down a proof of. Does this mean that it is necessarily computable? Can you actually write an algorithm for it? So these two are very, very different things. Maybe something is provable. But it might be that you might not be able to write a an algorithm for it. And this is precisely the nature of this problem. You know, you have, you're given these set of tiles, you know that you can tile the plane, uh, or maybe you cannot tile the plane. One of these two things has to be true, but you can't write an algorithm for it. And this is at least the first time when I saw this fact blew my mind. I, I and I think that this is uh, very, very deep. So these two notions were both refuted. First of all, there's Godel's incompleteness theorem, which showed that if you have any reasonable axiomatic system, then there'll be either statements that you make out of it, which are not, not true, or uh, which are n not true, or nor they are false. So this, so, if you have any system which is uh, sort of uh, consistent with each other and covers a reasonable portion of mathematics, then it has to be that you will be able to write down statements which you can neither prove nor disprove. So this challenges this, uh, OK, what is the limits of mathematical uh, proof system? This is a challenge to that. The second statement, which is, are things which are provable, are they computable necessarily? This was uh, challenged by Alan Turing's thesis. In fact, his PhD thesis, so people who are graduate students should uh, consider this as an inspiration that people can write such PhD thesis as well. And he showed that there are provable things which can't be computed. So, and the germ of the idea there is very, very simple. Think of uh, something of this uh, sort. So suppose you know that if I give you an algorithm, it will either stop, either halt, or it will not halt. It will run indefinitely. So now the question is, can you decide whether an algorithm will halt or not? And it turns out you cannot decide this because it's, it's like the statement, uh, I am lying. This cannot be true because uh, otherwise I'll be lying. And it can't be false because then it is true. So it's some, this kind of contradic uh, contradictions which plays a role in uh, proving these things. Anyhow. To cut the story short, 
it turns out that for a specific problem there's no way you can tile uh, you can write down an algorithm so if i give you a specific tile set for example i gave you two examples then you can uh, find out whether or not the tiling is possible but if i leave you at the sea and if i uh, ask you to write down a general algorithm which will work for any tile set you won't be able to and this is not a question of your abilities it's a question of our collective abilities as uh, scientists and mathematicians or human beings in fact so as i said for every set of tiles this is either true or false and the theorem tells us that there's no general method which can work for every set of tiles so how does burger go about this so burger produced a set of tiles which can only tile a periodic table. this was the first step that he gave and then somehow he superimposed simple symbols of them of computation which followed the formalism which was developed by turing so turing was this guy who showed that there are provable things which cannot be computed and it turned out for his set of tilings with the superimposition an infinite tiling will exist if and only if this algorithm which i sort of superimposed will not end and since there's no algorithm to decide whether or not an algorithm will end there can be no algorithm to decide whether a tiling can exist or not so this is a little bit of a mind bend so let's go at this slowly so what did burger do burger produced a set of tiles which can only tile aperiodically first of all and this aperiodic tiling sort of provided a lot of space in between and we'll see a picture soon to give you some idea and what he did is on these spaces he embedded algorithms and the only way you can uh, continue this uh, tiling would be if the algorithm would not end the algorithm would be endless but there's no way one can determine whether or not an algorithm will end so this means that this problem is also undecidable whether or not a given tiling has uh, has an as has a tiling of the plane so his uh, tiles were these i'm lying a little bit there were some things on the corners as well you can go into the details in this uh, entire in this so okay so burger's example was much more complicated uh, but uh, robinson gave a very simple example which you can read from his paper so there was someone who uh, in the audience i think jesse who said that uh, he doesn't know uh, what the algorithm should look like uh, uh, say what the tiling set which would tile uh, periodically look like well it looks like this okay so up here, so you have these arrows and these double arrows are the ones which are important okay and what these it turns out that if you put them together now you will have to trust me on this is the following so these double arrows which we had here the force configurations of this sort so you have this hierarchical structure where you have these small tiles and these small tiles are contained in bigger tiles and so on and so forth so you have this bigger and bigger squares which are gradually covering the plane so this is the periodic tiling that he has now notice that in these tilings you have these vertical columns these are the spaces where now you will try to run the algorithm so you will put symbols here and you will be allowed to put these together if and only if the algorithm runs for this much time but since there's this hierarchical structure eventually you will have larger and larger spaces and your algorithm has to run for longer and longer time and therefore with these symbols 
the only tiling possible uh, that a tiling of the plane would be possible if and only if the algorithm doesn't end and thus we have undecidability of the tiling problem now i know that i haven't given you a full proof this is just to give you a broad idea and if at some point you're interested you should look up this paper and it will it's something that you can just pick up and read uh you need to know a little bit about turing machines but otherwise this is readable on its own all right so this was uh, 1966 1971 was this uh, simplification now in 1974 roger penrose came upon a set of tiles these are no longer squares but it gave rise to some special of periodic tilings so you have these tiles and on the edges you have some rules on how they can be put together and he took these tiles and he saw that the only way to connect them was to give this a periodicity one very important feature of this which i want you to notice is that it has some five fold symmetry if you rotate it five ways then it's not precisely symmetric but it is somewhat there it will match to a very large extent this is called uh, this later came to be known by as penrose tilings can anyone guess why penrose would draw such a tiling so i told you motivation of how why, why he was interested burger why he was interested robinson why he was interested why was penrose interested in this roger penrose as you know is a physicist maybe his uh, connection with this uh, computability idea or uh, he is the one who proposed that uh, consciousness is not computable right so maybe that connection right. to turing's mm -hmm. and okay so that's a justified and an educated guess it turns out his motivation was the following i wanted to design something interesting for someone to look at uh, someone in the hospital to look at so his motivation was you know he wanted to uh, you know there was someone in the hospital and he wanted to, to entertain that person uh, and that's why he designed this but this kicked off a huge body of work and he, which continues till date people keep on producing a periodic tilings like this is a and this is one of the advantages of a pretty picture one looks at it and one is somehow automatically motivated to study it and to understand it uh, better and i think that this is a fascinating picture i don't think i still understand it perfectly now here's when this where the story becomes interesting so in crystallography uh, crystallography uh, which was sort of uh what people were thinking about uh, quite a lot uh, which people even still think about a lot the people who predicted uh, so the usual mindset up until very long uh, like 1980s was that if you have a crystal if you have a material then the atoms must be in the crystal must be arranged periodically steen had Nelson and Ronchetti, Ronchetti predicted that such a crystal that there must be a crystal in this universe, in this world, such that with such an a periodic structure. And it turned out that this prediction went completely against the norm. it completely went against that uh, what is called the crystallographic restriction theorem what does the theorem tell us it tells us that such a tiling cannot exist it must have a three fold four fold or six fold rotational symmetry if you have a periodicity if you have some such structure then you must have a uh, five fold symmetry and this is you can sort of see that you have this five pointed star here in the middle and however 
Daniel Schekman in 1982, with no knowledge of these uh, theoretical developments, noticed that the diffraction, pa diffraction pattern from a certain alloy had 10 pole symmetry. So, as, as I told you, the modern crystallographical belief was that there should be three, four, or six. This meant that the atoms are not arranged periodically, that they must be arranged in some other fashion. This was the diffraction pattern that he noticed. And this created a huge, huge revolution in the field of crystallography and in material science. But nobody believed in at that point. In fact, the two-time Nobel laureate Linus Pauling said the following statement, there are no quasi-crystals, they're just quasi-scientists. And uh, the effect of this was uh, Daniel Schekman lost his job. He was uh, <laughs> kicked out. And it, it feels very funny to think of it this way right now. He was uh, given a lot of, lot of criticism because of this result. But you know how science progresses. It eventually comes back to realizing the truth fairly quickly. And Dan Schickman won, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2011. Here is uh, sort of that an alloy which has been looked at uh, electron microscope. If you zoom through it, you can see the symmetry. And to me, this is a wonderful story, right? Because it started from purely theoretical considerations of theorem proving, of puzzles, and uh, things which look pretty. And you have something which is very, very concrete, which might have, OK, we are still to find out which this uh, existence of quasi-crystals might have uh, very deep consequences. Uh, we don't know yet. And it turns out, now here, become, here, here it becomes even more interesting. Kepler, who is sort of considered the father of crystallography, found such a tiling three centuries ago. And he has this, uh, it's from his notes. You can look it up. Even more interesting, you see it a lot in Islamic, uh, is Islamic architecture you'll see a lot of these uh, periodicities, these hierarchical structures. So they are, people have been thinking about these things for various reasons. Maybe they look pretty, maybe they were, so people have been considering this. And there's this beautiful quote from Minograd which keeps on coming to my mind. He goes to say that we haven't seen everything yet. But when we do, it won't be for the first time or the last time either. So <laughs> this sort of uh, illustrates that how we as human beings or scientists, we keep on arriving at the truth or at understanding of nature from different directions, every sort of repetitively in some sort of cyclical fashion. Of course, we make progress as we go about in the cyclical fashion. But I, I think uh, it was a, uh, like when I sort of uh, realized the story and I thought that I really wanted to tell you about it. Any questions? I see that a lot of people unmute themselves and then they go away. But that might be because I'm talking too much. So uh, are there questions? Uh, I'm not getting. So uh, was uh, Kepler's pattern similar to Penrose's? Mm, I don't think so. So it was along the same direction. You can see this five-fold yeah. symmetry here as well. But uh, no, I don't. I don't think they were similar. Yes. And one can actually yeah, it is look. Different. Yeah. The yeah. main thing is that. Let me go back to the pattern. Uh, 
uh, you didn't have these uh, i think octagons which are there in uh, kepler's pattern or something like that sir yes 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 but then you know they are in the same ballpark if one may put it that way other questions is there any relation uh, exists between fractals and uh, the tiling problem i hope we'll get to some of it uh, towards the end there is uh, fractals are very natural objects and uh, it's very nice that you're thinking of fractals because you have this repetitive uh, phenomena that you have a small shape and you expand it and you still see that same shape and you expand it again you still see the same shape uh, so there is something to between these two it's not a correspondence uh, there are a periodic tilings which don't show any of this repetitive phenomena uh, but they are much more difficult to construct they were done by kari and kulik uh, and their sort of ideas come from number theory uh, and it's a very deep set of tilings which is of a very different which is a completely different nature from the tilings which we saw till now Uh, but there is some relation and uh, uh, let's just put it poorly understood other questions okay so let's uh, deal with a simpler question now now that we somewhat have an understanding of z2 let's look at z and let's consider two tiles so in case when we are looking at tilings of z it's somewhat simpler <coughs> suppose you just look at these two tiles and now suppose we want to tile z instead of z2 so all this uh, colors and all these things they sound a little complicated so let's just make the problem simpler we will call the tiles 1 to n and now you just have the simple thing you have rules which tell you which uh, number which symbol can sit next to the other one so it gives you some sort of order so so in this 2 can uh, 9 can sit next to 2 2 can again sit next to 9 0 can sit next to 2 and so on and so forth now if we continue placing letters next to each other then it must be that a letter repeats itself right since there are only finitely many letters if i keep on placing next to themselves uh, following these rules there has to be point when i repeat myself like for example this two repeats itself here or it must happen that beyond the point we won't be able to place a letter anymore so it turns out that for z we have a way of telling whether or not a given tile can tile the uh, given tile set can tile the plane right it must either be that you won't be able to tile periodically uh, you will be able to tile periodically or there will be a point beyond which you won't be able to tile anymore we realize that in z2 this was not possible because there are a periodic tilings but in z the situation is much simpler in z we have a way of telling whether or not a given uh, uh, it must be periodic or aperiodic uh, malika arjun i think you have a question or do you okay so i hope the situation with z is clear so uh Yes. A letter is the sequence, a sequence which is repeating itself. No, a, a letter just means one of these. Uh, one symbols. of these things, okay. okay. Yeah, and the repetitions are, for example, this two repeating here, or this zero yes. repeating here. Okay. And you know that if zero repeats, then I can just take this segment and repeat it hmm. periodically. Periodically, yeah. it is a very difficult question so we looked at two groups i hope that 
uh, so, uh, some of the audience has heard of groups before. It's a very difficult question to find out if you're given a group, is the tiling problem for that group decidable or not? Yes, the first sort of uh, thing that you can think about, I hope that you have heard about the free group on two generators, prove that the tiling problem on the free group for two generators is decidable. So its graph looks like the following. And you continue infinitely along this. And if you don't know what this is, then you should uh, Google it. Or you can ask me. I can tell you more about it. But it's something which uh, it's a nice object. Uh, it's a nice group, which we should become familiar with. So it what turns out that for, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. What are, the, what are the tiles for arbitrary group? So you don't think about this in terms of tiles anymore. You think of them as symbols. OK. And now, suppose I let's go back to the free group example. So then you have some sort of graph. So let's draw a part of the free group. And this continues indefinitely. And now on each of these vertices, you place your uh, place symbols. And now your rules determine what symbols can be placed here and what symbols can be placed here next to each other. And the question is, you, I give you a set of rules. Tell me whether or not you can uh, uh, put a symbol on each of these places. And if you are a little imaginative, you can think of these symbols as tiles. And this is telling us what kind of tiles, but it's sort of tiles which are shrinking, the sort of hyperbolic structure, if I am allowed to use that term. And you're asking whether the tiles can, so, and then you can start thinking about the colors as well. But you need not. Now you can just think about symbols and uh, how they are put together. So we have made a little bit of an abstract jump, but hopefully uh, uh, this is still understandable. Any other questions? Um, okay, so let's uh, go ahead. So it turns out that in one dimensional tilings, we can do far, far more. So let's look at a very, very simple example. So the symbols are only going to be zero and one, the tiles are only going to be zero and one. And the only rule that I have is that no two ones can sit next to each other. So you have something like this. So we have the sequence. And now what we are going to do is we are going to count the number of words that you can form using these symbols. So SN is going to be words of length n, where no two ones sit next to each other. Now, any such word has to either start with a 0 or a 1, right? Because the symbols are in 0 and 1. Now, if it starts with a 0, then you can follow it up with any word from Sn minus 1. If it starts with a 1, then it must be followed by 0. And then you can again put any word in Sn minus 2. So it gives the following recurrence relation that the cardinality of Sn is equal to the cardinality of Sn minus 1 plus the cardinality of Sn minus 2. And as probably a lot of you might know that this is the Fibonacci sequence, you get that the number of words of length n are 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on and so forth. 
So this is a much more general phenomena. So we have these letters one to n, and we have rules which determine what letters can sit next to each other. So the example that we had before said that a zero can sit next to itself. A zero can sit next to a one. There are no rules on how you put the zero. However, a one cannot sit next to itself. So this graph is telling you what symbols can sit next to it, uh, themselves. Here's a little more complicated graph where you have these, uh, you have this big cycle, then you have this small cycle, and the important thing that I want you to note in this graph is the following simple phenomena: that if I have a word of length n, it corresponds to a walk in the graph of length n. So I repeat myself: you have this graph, and the number of words of length n, s n, is the same as the number of walks of length n in the graph. So there's a correspondence between words. That I can form using these symbols, using these rules, and walks that I can do on this graph. So, this is what the graph is. You have these bunch of symbols, and there's some rule R. So the rule tells you that if I an edge. I and J can be put next to each other. Then we should draw an edge, like we drew an edge from from going from four to two, because we allow two to sit to the right of four. Is the graph clear? How I'm getting the graph, starting from the rule R. Uh, just on a related note, uh, we are also touching on the side of formal languages and automata uh, yeah. here, right? Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay, and graph theory is be graphs is being connected to. Right, and there is yeah. Okay. yeah. But uh, we won't go any further deeper into this. Right. Uh, this would uh, require a lot of. Uh, uh, this would require some time to go a little more. Deeper. Any other questions or comments? All right. So the number of words of length n, s n r, is the same as the number of words of walks of length n in the graph. Now consider a matrix which you can generate using this graph. This is called the adjacency matrix. And the entries of this matrix are the following: your ijth entry is equal to one, if and only if. So it's an array of numbers, as you know, an n plus n array of numbers. And the ijth entry is one, if and only if there's an edge from i to j. And now what happens if you look at the square of this matrix? If you look at this entry ij, there's a walk from I to J of length two. If there's a vertex in the middle, which you can go from I to J two, so you can first go to this third vertex K, vertex K, and then go to J. And so the number of paths of length two is given by A square I J. Let's look at this particular graph. So suppose I wanted to count the number of steps of length two. So I will first ask, uh, say, going from one to two. I'll first ask: Is there a walk on this graph of length two? So this gives me a three-letter word. So there's a walk of length two here, and this gives me a three-letter word, one which starts at one and ends at two. Similarly. And this would correspond to the square of the matrix. There would be an entry a one two, which would be positive. 
or in fact is equal to uh, one. So I hope there's some understanding of the correspondence between words and length. I have not been very precise, but roughly what it will, what you should understand is that if you look at the power of the matrix and you look at its ijth entry, then this will give words of length n plus one. So this is a typo, this should be n plus one. Right, if you have a walk of length one, a walk of length one is a two letter word. A walk of length two is a three letter word and so on and so forth. And the sum of the entries of a, a to the power n give you the number of words of length n plus one. And why is this interesting? This is interesting because the sum of the entries is uh, length n plus one. It follows that the number of words of length n plus one is roughly of the order lambda to the power n, where what is lambda? So the n, n plus one does not matter. So don't bother over this. So these are the number of words of length n. And what this is telling you is that, what this is telling you is that it grows like lambda to the power n, where lambda is the greatest eigenvalue of a. This is a general fact. So you look at a matrix and you look at the sum of the entries. This is a pos nice positive matrix. Then its powers grow like its greatest eigenvalue. And in the case of uh, uh, Fibonacci, the zero one sequence, which we talked about, this turns out to be the, this lambda turns out to be the golden mean. And this is why this is called the golden mean shift. So in general, what we would have is that this number lambda that we have here, this number lambda that we have here is the root of an integer polynomial. So there are nice algorithms to approximate this number lambda if you want. Okay, so we introduced in the last few minutes a lot of different things. So let's go at it slowly again. So I had this rule R to start with. I showed that this rule R gives rise to a graph. So it was a graph of this sort. And then I saw that counting walks in the graph is similar to counting words. So it turned out that it was related to the power of certain integer matrix. So entries of eight to the power n would give us words of length plus one. But there's some, there's a general mathematical theorem if you want, you can look at uh, peron frobenius theorem, which tells you that this number behaves like uh, the greatest eigenvalue of the matrix. So a theorem that you should keep in mind if you want to read more about it, is Peron Frobenius. So this is a nice situation. We can actually calculate the growth rate of the number of words that we find by a simple uh, finding by simply finding out the eigenvalues of this matrix. This number is called the entropy. This is related to the entropy defined by Shannon in the theory of computation, which is, which as far as we have been talking about it, has, seems to have no relation. We were just putting tiles together, right? 
sorry, not theory of computation, theory of communication. But now, as uh, Jesse pointed out, that this has something to do with formal languages, and it does, and it does have to, something to do with communication. And this quantity, this growth rate that I was talking about, is like sort of the complexity of the language that we are speaking in. It can be thought of it in this way. And this is precisely equal to log lambda. This is called the entropy. And what we have proved in this process is the following fact, that this entropy can be approximated very well in one dimension, because this is just a log of an algebraic number. Any questions? All right. So a good source to learn about all of this, if you're interested further, is an introduction to symbolic dynamics and coding by uh, Douglas Lind and Brian Marcus. Brian Marcus was my advisor. So it turns out, as we have already expressed in many different words, that maybe higher dimensions is vastly different. So let's look at this question in higher dimensions. So we have a finite set. And we have these set of rules that tell you how these uh, symbols from this finite set can be put next to each other. So we are putting this on Z2 lattice. And we realized earlier that there's no algorithm to decide whether or not it is empty. So let's look at the number of different patterns that one can form on an n by n box. If it is empty, then eventually this number will be zero. So you're looking at n by n box, and you're looking at all different ways in which you can fill this box, following the rules that you're given. And the entropy is again the growth rate of the sequence. So remember, earlier, we had this growth rate here, which was like lambda to the power n. So it turns out this fact that it is like some lambda to the power n is not difficult. It, uh, and how would you compute this, la uh, this lambda? Well, you would take the logarithm of this, the n would come down, and you would be left with log lambda when you divide off by n. So it turns out that this entropy, which is given this by this growth rate, is very fundamental. And this is called the entropy for this uh, set of restrictions. But another interesting fact, which is true, is that this number, the number of patterns that you can form with these restrictions on an n by n box, gives you an upper bound for this number hr. What does this mean? This means that if I just count the number of words that I have formed in a box, they'll give me an approximation for this entropy from above. So even though we cannot show that this is empty, we can, even though we cannot show that this is empty, we can still approximate the entropy from above. So I can find a sequence of rational numbers. I can write down a program which will give me a sequence of rational numbers which will approximate the growth rate from above. So this is what I just said. A number is called a right recursively enumerable number if there's an algorithm which can be approximated from above using and as you can see, there are only countably many algorithms you can write. So there are countably many right recursively enumerable numbers. And what Mike Hockman and Tom Merovich proved is that a number is the entropy for some set of rules like this, if and only if this uh, number 
is positive and can be approximated from above by rationals by some algorithm so this is a very very uh, deep theorem and it's a difficult theorem it's showing in some sense that the restriction that we uh, encountered at this point that you had this number which can be approximated from above is the only restriction and once you meet this restriction you can have an entropy of this form now let's put it in some slightly different words so these things are called shifts of finite type and we just saw that this entropy of shifts of finite type can be approximated from above but not necessarily from below so you can approximate these numbers from above but not necessarily from below and in nice cases we can approximate them from below as well so this entropy is a quantity which uh, sort of if you have some intuition then this uh, measures the level of chaos uh, one may say in those words and you're trying to see what is the amount of information that you can store using things which have these rules that's one way to think about entropy and it's of importance to physicists to communication theorists that one be able to approximate it but there are theoretical limitations to this in general you cannot do it if you take an arbitrary set of rules however in nice cases you can actually do an approximation from below as well so what are these nice cases and we come back for this purpose to periodic points indeed periodic points come to save us so suppose we fix this pattern on the boundary and look at the feature of this boundary the top is the same as the bottom and the left is the same as the right so you have uh, periodicity you have complete periodicity you can keep on repeating this pattern next to each other and you can form this but now if you have two different ways of filling this then you can fill them independently in so let's call these ways 1 and 2 so i can put whatever numbers that i want and that will fill the plane so what this would mean is that the following thing that so far there has to be a limit here sorry for the typo that this limit was um was given by this and this gave me an upper bound it turns out that if i look at periodic points then that gives me a lower bound and if and this okay so we should come back if and this is very very important if we have that there are lots of periodic points the enough periodic points to approximate the entropy then this lower bound will also give me an approximation from below so we have this so periodic points become important once again we have that if we have enough periodic points then this entropy can be very well approximated from the top as well and as from the bottom and this means that it, i can write down an algorithm which will approximate this quantity entropy and at any point of time if it's if i stop the algorithm i can see how close i am actually to the entropy so when you are approximating just from above then you have no idea if i stop the algorithm in the middle i might be very very far off i might be 1 million when the actually the entropy is zero however in this particular case if we stop the algorithm then we sort of uh, know that uh, we are either close to the entropy or not 
and but this okay so it uh, highly depended on this if that we have in our periodic points it is very difficult to prove very 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 difficult to prove even in the simplest cases okay so is the idea clear so suppose we have these bunch of boxes okay so the only restriction i have on these boxes is that the gcd the greatest common divisor of the lengths is 1 and the greatest common divisor of the breadth is also 1 as you can see the breadth has 2 and 3 so that's gcd is 1 and here you have 1 uh, which is equal to one length which is equal to one so that is also uh, the gcd is one and what we want to do is we want to look at tilings of zd by these boxes so something like this so it's a very very nice model it's a far cry from the difficult models that we were considering till now where you just had these colored tiles and you had rules on how to put them together this is much simpler you just have rectangles and you have no rules on how to put this together you can just put them together it is not known and in fact it's probably a very difficult question is the entropy of these space of tilings computable i don't know how to address this question can we write down an algorithm to approximate this number i have no clue and to me personally this is uh, one of the most fascinating questions which has motivated a large part of my recent research here is a much more curious phenomena which i don't know how to answer so this is supposedly a difficult question but here is a much simpler question so now notice carefully what will happen in the next few slides so we are start starting with this tiling and this consists of 2 by 1 dominoes that we started with and now we continue and we keep on extending i am not changing the tiling in the middle and i keep on continuing and i have a tiling of a box so a much easier question is the following suppose i give you a partial tiling can you always complete it to a tiling of a box i don't even know how to answer that so in the case of two dimensions when there are two tiles this is a result due to someone called uh, manfred einsiedler however if i increase the number of tiles maybe in two dimensions i have some idea how to handle it but suppose now you just take boxes in three dimensions or higher i'm absolutely clueless and it seems like a lot of hard work so there should be like this is one of these problems the result which i'm showing here is just for dominoes these 1 by 2 2 by 1 dominoes so this also uses some non trivial ideas it's not a trivial thing to prove that if i take dominoes and i take a tiling of this box i can just i can take i if i take this partial tiling to start with i can extend it to a tiling of the box this way that i described here where i spiral around is not arbitrary it is related to what is called cohomology of tiling spaces which had to be used to prove this very simple result and i'm not just dropping names if you want i can tell you how these play a role but we don't want to go into it right now we have 13 minutes left so this seemingly simple question i am giving you a partial tiling can you complete it to a box 
it would be lovely to find elegant ways to attack this problem and i don't have them with myself okay so enough with difficult questions now i want to ask something simpler so let's even simplify the question further maybe the problem here is that i am dealing with a lot of different tiles so let's suppose that instead we'll just take a single shape of course tiling by a single rectangle is very boring so we just take <coughs> an arbitrary single shape and now the question is this uh, can this single shape tile the plane or zd in general so a subset a of zd can tile zd if the joint copies of translates of a can tile the group okay so that is the definition and here is a tiling i took this cross i took this cross and i placed it all along and there is a very curious feature of this tiling can someone tell me quickly what is curious about this tiling the something that you should notice immediately what is the first word which comes to your mind when you look at this uh, tiling for me it's optical illusion sorry it's a uh, uh, for me the first thing was opti optical illusions optical illusions okay uh, that was unintended but i'm happy it is So periodic tiling is what I would say. I mean that's that's my yes. So indeed, this is periodic, and it turns out that that's the only way to do it. And this has something to do with the fact that this cross has five vertices, and five is prime. and that implies that the only way i can put them together is in a periodic fashion what does primality have to do with this i am not going to answer this question for you you can think about it or you can email me later if you want to know so the question which arises here is called the monotiling conjecture so suppose a can tile z d the question is can it tile periodic can it tile it periodically and uh, okay so it turns out that lagarius is a analyst and i think wong was so this is not the same how long that we had before this is yan gang wong and uh, uh, these are both analysts uh, lagarius i don't remember where he is Uh, Wong is somewhat close by. He's in Hong Kong. And the question that they asked was not in ZD. Well, they were also interested in ZD because it's a it's a simpler question. They were interested in RD. And the question arose as a part of what is called trying to solve Puglidis conjecture. It turns out that any such set which can tile if it tiles periodically, then it will also tile the torus. and now for torus we understand the uh, uh, spectral properties the l2 space very well it is spanned by its uh, so you can expand any l2 function as a sum of fourier series uh, as, as it's uh, approximated using its fourier series so the question was essentially characterizing sets for which there is a correspondence between nice spectral properties and the possibilities of uh, this uh, tie, uh, tilings and this is largely okay so fuglides conjecture was uh, disproved in five and higher dimensions by taritao i think right now we don't know whether it is true in dimensions 1 to 23 and there has been some progress uh there's a paper by neil lev and someone else who proves this in up to 5 uh for any dimension 
if the shape is um, uh, polygonal, uh, but it's a largely uh, uh, unsolved question. So, so just imagine the journey that we have taken up until now. When you started looking at this question, did you ever think that we would reach harmonic analysis? And this was proved by Lepton and Muller in 1991. For Z, this is an easy result. Given what I have told you up until now, you should be able to do it by yourself. For Z2, this becomes a very difficult theorem. And this was proved by Siddharth Bhattacharya from TIFR Mumbai in 2016. In 2020, Greenfeld and Terry Tao proved that, in fact, you take any tiling of Z2, then you can decompose it into finitely many parts, each of which are periodic. So the important thing that you should note in all of these results is two. Is there a question? Yes, Dilshad, you can go ahead if you have a question. All right, if not, it's wide open in R2. We have no idea how to attack this question. And now you can think, you know, these shapes in ZD will look like a bunch of squares. When we, have, we, have, when we are in RD, then you can have fractals. And these are important examples. There are tilings of RD, of R2, using fractals. And it's wide open in two dimensions. And it's wide open in dimensions bigger than two. And we have no idea how to attack this problem. So it's a very, very simple question, right? Take a single shape. I'm telling you that it can tile the plane. Can it tile uh, the space R square or not? And the reason why analysis turns up here is essentially you can look at these tilings as convolutions. And this is essentially how uh, uh, Fuglide was thinking about it, how Lagarius and Wong think about it, how Nierlev thinks about it, how Greenfeld and Tao think about it. And this, so there is, uh, tilings are not just puzzles. There's, uh, the, there's a lot of rich mathematics too. In fact, even tilings for Z, we have no idea. Uh, yes, Neil uh, I think there's a question. I didn't catch the name very properly, so I'm sorry if I uh, mispronounced it. So even in the case of Z, we do not understand what kind of tiles can tile Z. And there's some very, very interesting number theory questions around it. If you want to learn more about it, you can look at the papers by Ethan Cohen, which go back to uh, two dec uh, decades. You know, these are the questions which are open because people are not interested, and they're questions which are open because they're open, because they're difficult. And uh, there's a lot of people who are interested in this, and very smart people. And this makes this question uh, extremely interesting. So, as I said, questions are very interesting and they're plenty and they're spread evenly over many different areas. So, irrespective of where you come from, I hope that uh, this talk interested you. And uh, I think I gave a lot of questions, so happy solving them. And I think I'll end my talk here.